I'm just reading another of Robert's reports, if I can decipher it. Bricklayer's labourer, married, two rooms, six children. Earth closet. Wife Charles, clean and respectable. Class two file. Yes, but no figures, Mr. Rowntree. And at the bottom he's added one lodger, a... Oh, dear. A boiler smith. One lodger, a boiler smith. His writing's terrible. No details. Wages, food bills. Hello. Anybody in? Your mum or your dad? Hers in. Mrs. Oakley. Poor mice. Good morning. May I, uh... May I come in? Mrs. Ilkley? It is Mrs. Ilkley, is it? Oh, let be. What have I told thee about letting folk in? Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Ilkley. Now go on, off it. Get off and play. If I've told thee once, I've told thee a thousand times. Can't they keep an eye on them? Two weeks next Friday, that's what I said. Mr. Ilkley, well, he's not in work, thou knows that. Oh, I can't close my eyes and rest them for five minutes. I've got a dozen of these to be Mrs. sold for I can go... Mrs. Silkley, I'm not the rent man. Oh. Well, they can take the sen off double quick. Mrs. Silkley? Who told thee my name? Was it her across the way? Well, hers know better than she should be, the nose. Oh, I could tell the attorney Mrs. about Silkley, her. Mrs. if I could just ask you a few Tackling questions... Tackling about you, ones. Is that it? I know. I don't hit him, I don't. I'm not the cruelty man, either. We're conducting an inquiry. We're trying to assess the nature and extent of living conditions in all parts of York. Well, the best clear off. Inquiry's been done by Mr. Roundtree, uh, Mr. Seabomb Roundtree. That's right, of uh, Roundtree's Cocoa Works off the Axby Road. Uh, as you may know, a very uh, fair man, a caring man who wants to find out how folk manage. No thanks, all the same. He thinks folk aren't being done right by. Oh, does he? If you could just tell me how money goes round, if you get enough to eat and all clothes What does that mean? I can't look after my own. Oh, no, not at all, Mrs. Ilkley. Look, see here. We're visiting every house. House of every working man in York. Every wage-earning family. Well, happen so. They'll have to come back when Mr. Ilkley's here. Oh, I assure you we won't be using any names. Not even names at streets. Get this set oh, up. Oh, Mrs. Silkley, just five minutes of your time, please. Go on! Uh, two up, two down. Now get it? off, will uh, You live here with your husband and three children, is it? I bloody deaf for so much. Oh, oh. It, it's all right, Harry. You were just off. Don't seem to be moving, though, does he, Mrs.? I assure you, Mr. Oakley, we've, we've no intention of embarrassing you or your wife. The inquiry we're pursuing is very much in your own interests. Oh, aye. Right. Sounds to me like the book in the nose in where it didn't want it. Oh, no. Come on, you. Mr. Up to Oakley, me, please. Get out. Will you just let no, me explain? Mr. I'm Oakley, not enough to bother you. Get out. Oh. Any luck? <sighs> not going at all. He wants the head rent. Well, he wouldn't take no for an answer. Have to get rent. Paid landlord, isn't there? Oh, we with marbles. The in Alas every night, night after night. I can always find enough brass for that. Well, when a man can't work. Then he should drown his sorrows. When a man can't find work, it's like... It's like cutting his right arm off. Finished. I don't bloody pity. Lather Street. Slaughterhouses and piggeries round the back. Waste running in the drains. But no figures again, Mr. Roundtree. If I fought it on detail, the whole exercise will be worthless. And I can't make out the next one, either. Widow with small income. But how much is it? Mm. One up, one down, damp throughout, street drain blocked up. Grating missing near house door. How many feet away? Twenty-three houses in the yard and what? A single ash pit, oh, slime ash pit. running down the walls. One water tap for them all. Midden privies smelling to high heaven. You're right. 
His writing's terribly sloppy. Ah, oh, but his heart's in the right place. We must have facts, not opinions. Accuracy, not sentiment. Mm. I must go out with him, cover the ground again. If you ask me, I think that Robert will be far happier working here in the office, and I could do with the help. Uh, couldn't we, uh, couldn't we find a replacement for the outside work? There's a lot to be done here, now the street survey's nearly finished. How many families have we seen? 10,500. Still a thousand to go. Mm. And they've all these tables to be prepared. And as you say, they've all got to be checked. Ah. Now, could I, uh, could I have a word with you about this one? Hmm? I've added to it the figures for the 13-year-olds, the heights, at that school behind Warmgate. Now, the average height there is four feet seven inches. At the other school, that's the one near the cricket ground, the average height is four feet ten inches. Three inches. Seems a lot. Yes, that's about what I'd expect. You know Warmgate? Well, yes, of course. I mean, the family's shopped there for years. But you've never been into the streets behind the shops. Uh, well, but I'd rather well, you didn't. But Robert and I have been there, and that's where the back-to-backs are, the shared privies and the street taps. Mm, no gardens, though. No gardens. Not on a pound a week. That's what they earn round Warmgate. That's why the children are shorter. Like your plants, Miss Harlock, children need light, air, proper food and space if they're to grow. Now, these terraces round by the cricket ground, now, they're in a different world. Three bedrooms, taps indoors, gardens. There's only one factory nearby, and that's my father's. And there's not much smell and smoke from a chocolate factory. Mm, better wages, I suppose. Oh, yes. Three pounds a week, perhaps, if the older children are working. Do you know, I don't suppose, until work on these reports, I don't suppose that I ever thought about working people. At least not unless one of them was our servant. 1899 has been a year of experience for us both, Miss Harlock. I think we both stood up to it remarkably well. <laughs> oh, have you got those figures for me, for the study group tonight? Oh. My idea about the poverty line. Yes, here they are. And they're based on a man with a wife and three children. Ah, yes. Rent, four shillings. Right, you can't get housing for less than that. <laughs> Clothing, fuel, candles, etc. You've checked the shop prices? Yes, I have. Four and, Four and 11. eleven. Add food. That's twelve and nine for two adults and three children. That makes twenty-one shillings and eightpence. That's the poverty line in York. Twenty-one shillings and eightpence. And if you don't earn that much, and the average wage in Warmgate is only a pound... One pound, pound exactly. You have to save on food. You can't cut your rent, and you begin to eat less than a workhouse inmate or a convict in prison. Twenty-one shillings and eight pence. All that will give you is just enough to keep going. No more than bare physical efficiency. Let's be clear what bare physical efficiency means. A family must never spend a penny on omnibus or railway fare. They must never go into the country unless they walk. They must never purchase a Hagney newspaper. They must never write letters because they cannot afford the postage. They must not contribute to church or chapel or give to a neighbor. They cannot save. They haven't got the money to join a sick club or a trade union. The children must never have any pocket money for dolls, marbles, or sweets. The father must not smoke tobacco or drink beer. The mother must never buy herself a pretty dress. Should a child fall ill, it must be attended by the parish doctor. Should it die, it must be buried by the parish. And the man of the house the wage earner, must never be absent from work for a single day. If any one of these conditions are broken, if the family choose to spend on any one of these items, then they must eat less, sacrificing physical efficiency.
But, Mr. Rowntree, forgive me for interrupting, but surely that's too black a picture. After all, this is York. And besides, any school board officer can tell thee that working class put the children to work at earliest possible moment. They do, they do. He may indeed, sir, enjoy a brief period of comparative prosperity when the children are earning and still living at home, but he will fall back again into poverty when they're married and when he himself is too old to work. I believe in self-reliance, Mr. Rowntree. Right. I've worked hard for what I've got. Perhaps that's half trouble with some of the folk that are talking about. Mr. Rowntree, yes. I've the utmost sympathy with the poor. My husband and I are constantly visiting the very poorest of our parishioners, trying to bring some sense of decency into their lives. I myself try to give the women folk some instruction in the simplest principles of how to look after the home and feed the family. Now, tonight, you've not said one word about the real cause of poverty and neglect. Not one word about the huge sums that are spent every day in this city on gambling and ah, drink. Right. Yeah. So gambling and drink are almost certainly among the causes of poverty, Elia. But they themselves have causes. Poor education, houses in sordid streets, homes that are unhealthy and overcrowded, monotonous and heavy work that leaves a man with no strength to make a proper use of his leisure. No wonder that so many fall prey to the publican and to the bookmaker. I believe it's time, madam, for the state to consider its duties whether it can, by law or taxation, alter the distribution of wealth. It could, if the public conscience demanded, offer material help to individuals at those points in their lives where the burden is heaviest. But that's socialism, sir. No, madam, not socialism, but a new and enlightened liberalism. From a survey nine-tenths completed, I see that nearly 30% of the population of York is living in poverty. The same proportion uncovered by Charles Booth in his great study of London life. We have been accustomed to look at the poverty of London as being exceptional. Now we see that it's almost exactly equaled in a provincial city. We are faced with the startling likelihood that the case will be the same for all the town populations of the United Kingdom. Oh. Mrs. Ilkley, my name is Roundtree. Is your husband here? Someone told him there were a labouring job going over Fulford Way. Perhaps we could come in for a moment or two. Listen. I do worry about him, I do. Do you have a lodger, anything like that? <laughs> so my hopes. I mean, who'd want to stop here? I go cleaning twice a week, and I take in sewing when they let me have some. Cleaning? Do you get the usual rate? What do they pay now? Penny a shirt. It's three farthings. You shop at the co-op, I suppose. No. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't. Thank the Lord, I can bake my own bread. The children, do they ever get ill? They don't go without, if that's what that means. No, oh, Mrs. Hilke. I don't mean that you keep them short. Little ones just getting over whooping cough. Sometimes I don't know how I manage. I get so wonder. I take it out on the children. Always behind, no matter what. I mean, another six months on the rent, that's the latest. I mean, the landlord was going to mend back bedroom roof. I mean, he promised months ago. What is it now? Three shillings and sixpence? Four shillings. Four shillings a week for this. Oh, 
Harry. Listen to me, Wilton. Hush up, woman. I'm in work. Down at sawmills. Only fetch you didn't carry in mind, but 20 shillings a week. 20 shillings. Oh, Harry. Grand, eh? That's grand. How's that for a Christmas box, eh, no? Eh? Figures on Ilkley family, Mr. Rowntree. Oh, yes, Mr. Ilkley and his 20 shillings. I reckon Mrs. Ilkley might earn 18 pence a week on average. Uh, that's nearly up to your poverty line, isn't it, Mr. Rowntree? But uh, he drinks, that'll mean... Well, wouldn't you if you were Ilkley? No, never mind. Point is, you've understood the figures and you deserve a change from the street work. What about a spell in the office? The real work will be here for a few months. Oh, yes, please. I mean, uh, thank you, Mr. Rantry. Right now, Robert, you can begin with these. I want the book to have some clear tables and diagrams. Can you take on this? You'll need a compass and a lot of care. Seaburn Rantry called the book Poverty, a study of town life, and it was published in 1901. It played an important part in the political arguments about whether the state should act to help those who were poor in ways they couldn't avoid, because of low wages, old age, sickness. David Lloyd George took the lead among liberal politicians who believed that the state should act, and Roundtree's book helped form the basis of his convictions. The problems of the sick, of the infirm, of the men who cannot find the means of earning a livelihood are problems with which it is the business of the state to deal. They are problems which the state has neglected too long. It is a shame that a country should allow those who have toiled to end their days in penury and starvation. For it is hard, most hard, that an old workman should have to find his way to the gates of the tomb, bleeding and footsore through the brambles of poverty. We cut a new path for him, an easier one, a pleasanter one through fields of swaying corn. Lloyd George and the Liberal government of 1906 went on to lay the...